Our first Bible reading tonight comes from Genesis chapter 12, and this is the call of Abram. Genesis 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To you, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Um, our second Bible reading this evening is from the book of Romans. Um, so if you have a Bible or a device or you just want to follow along and listen along, Romans chapter 4. We are Romans chapter 4, verses 13 to 25. Verses 13 to 25. This is God's word. For the promise to Abram and his offspring that he would be heir to, of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but there is no law that there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who states the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In, him he, in, in hope he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the, de from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Amen. Let me pray before we open up God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the time that we can meet this evening. And as we open up your word, may you speak to us through your word. May it ground us, may it focus us, may it hold us strong. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. I wonder if I say the name Charles Blondin, does anyone recognize that name? Some people do, yes. Well, Charles Blondin on the 15th of September, 1860, performed a high wire walk across Niagara Falls, the gorge, and his party trick was pushing a wheelbarrow across to the other side and he would do lots of tricks along the middle he would jump he would walk on the tightrope and there was a large crowd one day and the crowd he turned to the crowd and he said do you believe i can go across with someone sitting in this wheelbarrow and the crowd crazy and of course they started of course we believe of course we believe can i get a volunteer he asked silence no one was prepared to put their faith in him by getting into the wheelbarrow. They were happy to sit, they were happy to watch, but they weren't prepared to step out and prove what they believed. 
And if I'm honest, I don't blame them. Um, Tightrope walking, not that I'm aware of, not that I know of, or I will ever try, can never be achieved without taking that first step onto the wire, that step of faith. And that's where we're headed this evening as we look at this character of Abraham, or Abram, as Mark called him, called us in chapter 12. And as we step into Scripture this evening, it is my prayer that the faithfulness of God will be revealed as each of us, on our own journeys of God with Him, see His faithfulness. May we be ready to step out and to stand on those promises that the Scriptures revealed, standing on His promises. And as in Genesis chapter 12 this evening, we see that I want to see where we're going to be spending our time this evening. Because faithfulness is one of those unchanging attributes. Drew talked at length what I mean that God is faithful this morning. It means He always does exactly what He says He will do and acts accordance with His nature. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9. In 1994, while I was still in nappies, there was a, fav- a famous advertisement by Ron Seal, which is a wood stain and wood dye manufacturer. And I wondered, do you know their tagline? It does exactly what it says on the tin. I'm sure you can picture the advertisement, Ron Seal, it does exactly what it says on the tin. And when God says something, we can rely that he, we can trust and we can rely that he will do it. We can rely on the tin. We can rely on God's Word as we journey through it, as we wrestle with it, what He says He is. In Genesis 1, all the way through to 11, what do we have? God has created all things. He makes human beings in His image to steward the world on His behalf. Humans choose sin and rebellion, and so the world spins out of control and is out of sync with how it was originally created. And so the big question could be asked in Genesis chapter 1 and onwards, Genesis 3, what is God going to do to rescue the world from this sin? And Genesis 3.15 tells us that He was going to send someone who was going to crush the head of the serpent. And how would this play out? Well, promises were going to be made, promises that God could not break because that would go against His very nature. And we meet Abram, or we'll just call him Abraham, in chapter 12, and many say he is one of the most important people throughout Scripture. And we read in Romans 4, and you can get an overview of what that means, and we'll pick up up, up that later. And as we open Genesis 12, he's 75 years old, he's a nomad, he's childless, he's nothing really special. In chapter 11, in the Tower of Babel scene, the people who built the tower said, let us make a name for ourselves, in Genesis 11 verse 4. They wanted to make their name great. They didn't want to be scattered all over the earth that God had commanded that they would be a great nation. And now in Genesis 12, God calls Abraham. And what does he say? I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Did you count how many times we have this idea of I will? Five times, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. God was going to do for Abraham what he had refused to let the people of Babel do for themselves. When God called Abraham, he didn't lay out his whole plan before him and say, okay, here's what's going to happen here. Here's what's going to happen here. He said, you're going to have to simply step into it and go. God didn't tell Abraham exactly where he was going. He promised to make Abraham's offering numerous as the dust on the earth and the stars in the sky. Genesis 13, 5, and then we read that in chapter 15. And put yourself in Abraham's situation. I'm sure those promises would have felt quite far off. He was promised a land, but he was still a nomad, wandering. He was promised numerous descendants, but his wife was still barren. And God spoke to him again in Genesis 15 and says, Do not be afraid, Abraham. 
I am your shield, your very great reward. And what we do have in the privilege here in 2020 is being able to read on in the rest of the story and see the faithfulness of God played out, displayed from generation to generation. And the idea of faithfulness in the Old Testament is under, sometimes understood as steadfastness or truthfulness. And that our God is faithful is a theme that is repeated time and time again within Scripture. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. Psalm 33, verse 4. And then God enters into what we call covenantal relationships. And a covenant is this unchangeable, divinely imposed agreement between God and man that stipulates the conditions of their relationship. He enters into a covenant with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, for example, where God willingly binds himself to a committed relationship. It's a gracious move from his side that prompts his people to rely on him. And Abraham's acknowledgement of God's faithfulness can be seen as a response to go, to leave his home in this confidence that throughout his life, God will do what he has always said he would do. And I encourage you, I know Drew gave you homework this morning if you were watching, but to read the rest of Abraham's story. This trust in God's faithfulness freed him in that incredible and scary scene in Genesis 22 to offer up his son Isaac in, the 22, in the Genesis 22. However, I think it's important as we sit here this evening in 2020 in Bloomfield Presbyterian to highlight that God is faithful even when we, his people, are not. And this was the fact for Abraham, and this is the fact for us this evening. For example, we know that Abraham lied about his relationship with his wife Pharaoh in the fear of his life in Genesis 12, just so, shortly after our reading. And then in Genesis 12, you can read that again in Genesis 20. He also questions God's ability to say, hey, there's no way you can give us a son. And in these places of uncertainty and doubt, Scripture tells us that God met Abraham where he was and remained faithful to his promise. And I like what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. In Genesis 15, God speaks to Abram and deals with his doubt by making him with a covenant. So if you flick over to Genesis 15, maybe, if you have your Bibles open. In those days, contracts were made by the sacrificial cutting of animals with the split carcasses of the animals lying on the ground. And the covenant was made when the parties agreed and walked through the animal parts together, repeating the terms of the covenant. The blood was a reminder of what would happen if one person didn't uphold their end of the covenant. And then in verse 12, when the sun went down and it was dark, Abraham is waiting to go through this with God together. Abram was asleep, still groggy from the deep sleep, and he saw God do an amazing thing. Abraham saw God pass through the animal parts all by himself as Abraham watches from the sidelines. The certainty of the covenant God made with Abram was based solely on God himself, not on who Abraham is or what he was going to do. This covenant could not fail because God was the one making the terms and he could not fail because of who he is. And then if you think about who Jesus is and what he has done, in a sense, the Father walked with the broken and the bloody body of Jesus to establish his covenant with us. And God signed it for us both. And we merely enter into that covenant by faith. We don't make the covenant with God. And this relational dynamic of God's faithfulness is carried throughout Abraham's life. And as we sit here, as you sit here looking at me with our masks on, wherever you're at, I ask some questions of us at this time. Where are you currently on your journey of faith? How has God remained faithful to you despite times of unfaithfulness on your part and on my part? Are there specific promises of God that you are standing upon? And one of the ways that we see this faithfulness in Abraham's life was the growth of the descendants of the, who became the Israelites in Exodus 1 verse 7. 
And he reassures them that he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Exodus 34. And the descriptions of God's character overall in Exodus 34 captures this idea of God's faithfulness in multiple expressions. And this was an important anchor for the Israelites to hold on to, especially during times of a continual faithlessness and wandering. And I think it's important for us, if we're in school, if we're in work, if we're in university, if we're at home, we can rest on His promises. And all these promises that God made to Abraham point forward. They point forward to the New Testament and the arrival of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the promises God made in the Old Testament. Jesus proclaimed that he was the promised Messiah, that he came to deal with our sin. And then when the Jews asked him in John chapter 8, are you greater than our father Abraham who died? Jesus responds, I assure you, before Abraham was, I am. Because remember, the Jews looked to Abraham as their model of righteousness. They would use the argument of faith by works, but Abraham was not an example of salvation by works, but an example of salvation by faith alone. Romans 3.10, none are righteous, not even one. But this one we have in Jesus then, the answer to the question, how can a faithful, righteous God dwell with an unfaithful, unrighteous people? The answer is Jesus. The demonstration par excellence of God's faith, faithfulness and steadfast love combined. In him, all the obstacles of his people's sin are overcome, and through his sacrificial death and resurrection. It is supremely in the cross of Christ that this steadfast love and faithfulness come together. Drew quoted from Hebrews chapter 13 when he said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Our world is constantly changing. Fashion changes, culture changes, trends come and go, but the gospel truth remains unchanged, and it's forever unchanging. We sing to you, God, who is what? Faithful one, so unchanging. And this evening, you know what you and I need more than ever in this ever-changing world. We need the changeless truth of Jesus Christ and His crucifixion. The changeless Christ who is completely reliable. We don't need a hip. We don't need a cool Jesus with the latest trends. But we need the exalted Christ who lay down His life for sinners and reigns triumphantly at the right hand of God until so, until He returns. It is that Christ, that gospel, that changes lives. And this evening, as we approach the table, we don't do it on our own merit. We approach the table and these elements by the blood of Christ, that Jesus who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The ever-faithful Christ and the never-changing gospel is the very foundation of what we as believers stand on. In the midst of our trials, in the midst of our suffering, our unbelief, our doubt, our struggles, we have a God who doesn't run away, who doesn't say, get on with it, work it on by yourself, who promises to walk alongside, to draw close, to walk alongside. And it's because of God's faithfulness, evident throughout Scripture and demonstrated on the cross of Christ, that we, a faithless people, can be restored to Him. United to Christ Jesus, we may be confident that we can be accepted in His sight. This evening, we have a faithful God who is faithful to all His promises, promises that will remain until Jesus returns, and when the consummation of all God's promises will be realized. Because God has proven faithful, we may trust in Him with confident expectation that all he has said, he will do. First John chapter 1, verse 9. 
If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and He will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. We have a God who is faithful despite our faithlessness. Let us approach Him this evening in faith, in boldness, because of what He has done on the cross. Let us join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You that we can approach You with boldness in wisdom and in strength because of the work You have done on the cross. Thank You that we can meet this evening as a body of Your people, connected by You. We thank You for what You have done, that You are the faithful God, so unchanging. And this evening, as we think ahead into this week, may we completely rely on Your promises. May we stand firm on those promises that you have revealed to us in your word. And may your word be the final authority for our lives. In an ever-changing world, you are unchanging. The gospel truth never changes, and you're always with us. We thank you for who you are, and we pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.